Here comes the wind. When the roller derby skaters knew what was happening on television, um, and they realized that they were becoming stars, it really changed the way they skated too, and and had it, you know, they were aware a lot more of the entertainment value of what they were doing, and also how to make themselves stars. And of course, the unfortunate thing was they really couldn't see themselves because there wasn't videotape in those days. So these games were all televised live. And it wasn't even until a little while later they came with a kinescope, which still wasn't very good, but it was, you know, at least something of that nature. Um, Roller Derby was a media hit on CBS, and the other um, stations and networks uh, bid for it. And it was on the Dumont network for a while, and then eventually ended up on ABC. ABC was on what was called the coaxial cable at that time. There was 13 uh, cities, I believe, ranging from Chicago eastward up to Boston and, and down um, to Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, that could actually get the programs live. And Roller Derby was on against really very other, very minor forms of entertainment. Hollywood wouldn't let their stars appear. Um, there was no major attraction that was really on television. And before a year was out, Roller Derby was on for three and a half games a week. Um, three full games and then uh, starting with halftime in the second half on, on a Saturday afternoon. And it, it, uh, it evolved into six teams, most of which skated in the New York and Philadelphia and Washington era, area. Um, the Brooklyn Red Devils, the, the Jersey Jolters, um, and you could not, since it, this was happening in New York, you couldn't pick up a magazine, you couldn't um, uh, see, you know, any, all the daily papers were competing with each other to see who could do stories on some, some fact, the roller derby, primarily always the women of roller derby, because again, that was, you know, the most interesting aspect to so many of them. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> David, you did that on purpose. <laughs> well, don't put them away, but you can. <laughs> You know, there's a fence. Oh, is that it, yeah, just pull. Right he'll walk with you and then just put it across. Oh, Here, right. take these balls with you, and he'll go absolutely. He'll follow you. Wherever these balls go is where he'll go. Is that right, Larry? Let's see. Was Five, Well, maybe Roller Derby created television. Um, obviously, it was a big help, but as you'll see, it was also did a lot of harm. Um, there were probably skating six to seven games a week in the New York area, three and a half which were on television. And after a while, people who had access to television realized they could stay home. And uh, the magic of being able to see this game was deluded by the fact that it was on so many times during the week. And uh, 1949 was just a banner year. Uh, my father convinced Ned Irish that uh, 
to let him have Madison Square Garden in June. Um, he really didn't want to do it because he felt roller derby was not a proper kind of attraction. The building was not air conditioned, and they had the uh, the championships in Madison Square Garden. And in five days, they drew almost 50,000 people, and it just seemed like nothing could stop it. Um, my father wanted to end the season afterwards and move out of the area and ABC said to him look at your contract we're paying you five thousand dollars a week um, and as long as you're under contract you have to provide games so I don't know what other sport could have endured this but the season ended maybe on June 15th and the new season started on June 16th and it went on that way for almost four and a half years until finally my father said, um, I can't do this anymore, you know, I'm going to shut it down. And ABC said, if you shut it down, you know, we were, we're not going to televise it anymore. And that kind of ended the whole, um, that, that wonderful time in New York. And he tried to put it on other networks, but uh, by that time, you know, Uncle Milty had come on. And, um, you know, there was a, there's always been a niche for roller derby. But not, you know, a primetime show three days a week uh, was really kind of asking too much of it. What year was that? And, um, 19, probably 52, 53, right in that area. Right. 1952 is when it really went off the air on a network basis in New York. Well, it was, it was kind of strange because we lived in Portland, Oregon. And my father was on the road a lot. And I first saw roller derby, um, I believe it had to be 1937, 1938. We would, went down to Los Angeles where it was playing the Pan Pacific Auditorium. And we would spend six weeks down there, my mother and my sister and myself, and my father would be there. And we'd go every night and, you know, got to know the skaters and Buddy Atkinson would babysit us when they, you know, have to go someplace else. And um, then we'd go to San Francisco. Uh, we were here for the World's Fair in 1939, 1940. And Roller Derby was at the Civic Auditorium in San Francisco. And it was very exciting because a lot of people don't know and it's still there. Um, there is a, like a trap door in the center of that floor of the Civic Auditorium, but even when they remodeled it, it's now Bill Graham Auditorium, that, that door is still there. And the skaters lived in the building. They actually lived down below. At, at that time, the skaters lived, you know, still they were cooked for in the building. They lived in the building. And when they would announce the team, this door would open right in the middle of the track and up would come, up the stairs would come the skaters. And, uh, I'll, you know, I always remember that. And every time I go to the Civic Auditorium, I go check, make sure that that door is still there. So, you know, you've just learned a little secret. So then, um, and my father, you know, we, we would see him occasionally. But at that time, really, it wasn't an everyday thing with us. Um, then when my mother died in 1942, um, we moved to Chicago at that time. And... Then I became a lot more aware of the game because the Coliseum was there and was closer to it. But, you know, of course, I, I was young. I was going to school and I eventually went to high school there. And then um, never intended to really get into roller derby. Um, I would see it and enjoy it, but I went to uh, Stanford. Then I graduated from Northwestern, went into the Army, and came out, got married, moved to California where... I had another job, and um, so it's you know I was never really aware of what the day-to-day -day operation was, and and my father never forced that at all either. You know it was kind of what he did, but it wasn't as though he really expected a, you know the family to go into it. So what was your other job at that point? Uh, I actually was working for my uncle Oscar, the Roller Derby Skate Company, and introduced 
the first outdoor shoe skate. It's called the Street King. I think that was in 1954. And um, eventually moved to Northern California and opened and ran a warehouse up there and handled that territory. And it was complete, uh, the complete line of skates. It was ice skates, roller skates, and the outdoor shoe skate. And figured that eventually I would go into something else. Um, and my father called me and said, you know, roller derby's coming up to the San Mateo Fairgrounds. Do you want to add, earn some extra money by announcing? Well, that scared me to death. I mean, I, I was not exactly an extrovert. But I was making $100 a week, and the idea of working five nights for $25 a night on top of that, that was very attractive. So that was really my introduction to roller derby, you know, going there and announcing. And, and, and it, it's a very funny thing with the skaters because most of them had known me as a kid or Leo's son. And now, you know, 25, 24, 25, I guess I was then. You know, I was coming in and announcing and then more or less leaving. And that, I believe that was 1958. Tell me about the pivotal moment when you decided to actually take over the world. Well, you know, one of, <clears throat> in 1958, again, I started announcing, but then um, a, Roller Derby was really in deep trouble then. It moved out to the Pacific Coast, to the West Coast, primarily operating out of Los Angeles. My uncle operated it at that time at the uh, Olympic Auditorium in Los Angeles at the Armory. And, um, but he was very involved in the skate company. And my father um, had started doing land development up in Lancaster, which is near north of Los Angeles. And really, I would have to say they kind of, you know, were losing interest in it. My father was still trying very hard to, you know, to get it back on a national basis. He just didn't like operating out of Los Angeles. And ironically, ran at the same station with KT, situation with KTLA down there, who wanted to run it every day and I mean every week and never stop and that went over four or five years well all of this is going on I really didn't know about it and suddenly all of the managers that had been in Northern California were sent one was sent to Chicago one was sent to somewhere else and I kind of became the de facto manager in 1958 of, of roller derby in Northern California and when it shut down um, I talked to my father, and he says, you know, it's just, I'm not going to reopen this. He said, I'm not going to start it in Los Angeles again. And um, again, one of these fortuitous timings, Channel 2, KTVU had just come on the air in San Francisco. We're looking for programming, and I met with um, Ward Ingram, who's the general manager, and uh, being independent, looking for all kinds of fringe programming. And he said, if you know, if you'll provide a roller derby program, I'll put it on the air. Well, it was initially every Saturday night. And I thought, boy, that'd be a great promotional thing up here, because we really didn't have that here. We had come up without television when, when I was working uh, for my father. So I said to my dad, you know, we can get television. He said, well, I'm not going to run it. And I said, what if, you know, if, what if you lease me the track? And I ran it, and he said, well, you have to negotiate with all the skaters, and that must have been nuts now that I think about it. You know, I was 26. And uh, made a deal with Channel 2, uh, rented a abandoned uh, mechanics garage on East 14th Street in Oakland. We put up some bleachers, about 150 of them, put up a track for a training school, and then one night a week we televised from there. And that's how we started on Channel 2. Um, and then I did kind of the revolutionary things of starting these one-nighters of instead of skating continuously at the fairgrounds or at the Oakland Auditorium or at the Armory in San Francisco, added San Jose one night, um, then Sacramento, and then Richmond. And before long, we were kind of skating a whole circuit of one-nighters, which, you know, and the funny, the skaters considered anything away from Oakland is out of town, you know, so, you know, which is kind of ironic considering the road trips we put them on later. 
So um, this went on, and it I sure. Do we have a lot of questions to go over? Well, it wasn't quite that easy. You know, again, uh, without starting with the sufficient cash, you're always kind of running to keep ahead. Uh, by this time, we had started taking television from Keysart Pavilion in San Francisco. And um, our sponsor at that time, um, a Chevrolet dealer, had an agency in Portland. And he said, you know, if you'll take the game, um, you don't have to edit or anything, and I'll show it in Portland and pay the freight and give you a few dollars. It wasn't really very much. And we figured that was good because then if we got a tape, which he'd pay for, then Channel 2 would rerun our game the, the last hour next Saturday, and we could get the benefit for additional promotion for the weekend. So they ran the tape in Portland, and one day he came in to me, and he says, you know, during one of the commercials, I just kind of threw out there, how do you like roller derby? And he said, look, and he had this huge pile of letters from all around Oregon. And he said, you know, why don't you bring a game up there? So uh, we talked to the Memorial Coliseum, um, allowed a few days on either side, and scheduled a game up there. And much to our surprise, we sold about 8,000 tickets. And I suddenly realized what videotape could do, uh, you know, videotaping the games. And we sat down and working out of our office in Oakland, we started syndicating the show on a very simplistic basis. Uh, we would have stations bicycle the tapes. Oakland uh, might ship to Reno. Reno would ship to Las Vegas. Las Vegas would ship to Kansas City ad, ad, ad infinitum. Um, so that the games weren't relative to anything we were doing. I mean, maybe in Biloxi, they'd see a game six months after it occurred. But within a couple of years, we were on 120 stations around the country, and including Canada. And off of this, we were now able to start scheduling winter uh, games because the Bay Area season was primarily from April through September, late April, early May. Right, and then we would uh, put little things in each one of the tapes. Two announcements per tape. One was, if you'd like a free copy of the Roller Derby Rules, write to Box 1820 at Oakland, California. And the other we put in, if you'd like to get advanced information about a game in your area. And we check that mail every day. And we'd see which stations were up and down. And we'd get the ratings and we'd kind of compare. Surprisingly, sometimes stations that apparently had low ratings yet had a very intense following. And basically, although a number of people, including Ann, would say that we scheduled the games by throwing a, a dart at a map, uh, basically what we would really do to set up a winter tour would be to take these cities where we were on the air and we knew we were doing well and then kind of overlay all the building availabilities, the arenas in those areas or in the outlying areas. And that's really how our tour started, which probably first started in some, you know, 1963, 1964, and really became a, an annual event until the time that we shot Roller Derby Down in 1973. It was very, very difficult. Um, it was very hard f f to say to them, this is the only way this game is going to survive, because basically from making very little money, you know, they were starting to be being paid commensurate salaries with 
obviously what we can afford and we even had the stars getting really was very good money for those days uh, we also instituted a profit sharing program which many of them never really believed existed until we shut down and they were quite surprised at the size of their profit sharing that they received afterwards um, but uh, uh, most of the skaters ever since the there had been a really a very tragic bus accident in 1937 that virtually destroyed roller derby at that time and my father almost shut it down and uh, superstition was they they don't like to ride buses they didn't like to ride buses so the road trip was accomplished mainly by cars skaters would take their individual cars get mileage take one or two other skaters with them go from town to town uh, it, they might drive for five to six hours get into the town um, get their uniforms washed, get ready, uh, get to the building, skate a game that night, go to a strange motel, uh, get up the next morning and drive to the next city. And generally we had between four and five games a week when they were on the road. At home we generally had six games a week. But uh, and this, it, it seemed, I know the skaters to be interminable, but the thing was that it was just amazing was they go into St. Louis and they get ten or eleven thousand people. Uh, go to Nashville and the auditorium would be sold out. Madison Square Garden, you know, fifteen to seventeen thousand people. And uh, often the newspapers and all would be astonished. Uh, the um, St. Louis uh, Post Dispatch writer, remember the story was he came into Keel Auditorium, thinking he was going to see this kind of a bizarre attraction and have 200 people in the stands and here Keel is sold out and he didn't even know about it and the reason he didn't know about it was because unlike traditional sports there weren't stories in the sports sections there weren't uh, you know so-called flax out there kind of beating the streets for it it was just mentioned on television in in St. Louis and I remember the story because he said I could not figure out what was going on in the track, but everybody else in that building knew. And they knew the players, and they knew the girl with green hair, and they, they knew when, you know, so-and-so did such and such. And it, I mean, it was really a very cleverly written story, but um, it was really put best by Robert Lipset for the New York Times, um, who wrote really a wonderful story on roller derby, and the headline was, The People Know. You know, in, in essence, was you may not even know what's going on here. Uh, this is an attraction that has a lot of slam bam, and people look at it and say, you know, well, is this theatrics? Is it real? But the people who come and pay, they get their dollars worth, and maybe other sports could learn something from that. And uh, the only ones who really have to worry about it are the fans who come and the people know. They know what it is they're seeing and why they're there. And that was a kind of a universal response. So this. This really became kind of the second um, big time for roller derby. And uh, probably even more excitement than in the 40s because a lot more people had television sets, a lot more were aware. Uh, there still was no cable, there was no satellite at that time, but uh, media was just so much better than it had been, you know, as little as 10, 15 years before. And that is. Uh, you know that was that was kind of my era of roller derby, and it lasted on that basis and until 1973. So um, let's go ahead and talk about 1973. Where was roller derby at when you decided to close? Um, a number of factors had had come about. Number one, um, we uh, never really were financed like other leagues. It was really a family business that was, you know, operating this apparently the International Roller Derby League. You know, obviously we owned all six teams. We arranged all the schedules. Um, we received no revenue from television. You know, the few dollars that covered shipping, um, and our syndication was really costing us a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, which was an awful lot of money at that time. Now, not that we're complaining because it, without it, we couldn't have done 
you know, all we did on the road trip. But this is the day of, you know, one, two, and three dollar tickets at the Madison Square Garden. We had to really think twice before we went up to five dollars. Um, and in early in 1972, a program director came on to Channel Two, who's in in Oakland, which is really was our had been our prime station for 15 years. We just didn't like it at all. And suddenly, from being on in prime time on Sunday night, we were pushed back to six and eventually to four o'clock. Well, we were the number one show in that time period, but unfortunately, you know, summer in San Francisco at four o'clock, not a lot of people are watching television. So the attendance in the Bay Area suffered. Uh, then we hit a gas crisis that, that year. And when we went out on the road trip, we suddenly found a lot of arenas, in, especially in the smaller towns, were closing a lot of the nights, or they weren't heating them. And people, uh, we would find that when we go into Scranton and these other areas, people would come from 60, 80 miles. Well, that wasn't happening. That was the first tour that we lost money on. Um, and just finally, you know, I, I had really been running it for 15 years and um, sat down with my accounting people who said, you know, if you're going to continue with this, you know, you're really going to, if you're going to continue with this, you're really, somebody, somebody's walking out there. It's a problem. Larry! Quiet. Oh, oh I'm sorry. I'm I'm sorry. What was this? We sat down with your accounting. Right. I uh, sat down with the, um, our accounting people who said that we really would have to go out and borrow a large amount of money uh, to continue um, to get through this season and not even counting starting the next season. And with our television picture looking bleak in the Bay Area, um, we all really just came to the conclusion that this particular run of roller derby. Um, that is so unusual. Yeah.
well, it certainly, you know, was not a happy time. Um, really, we looked over every option, trying to think what else we could do, how we could shorten the season, what other things we could do. But um, at the time, you know, we were fairly heavily into debt, and I intended to pay it all off, which we did. And uh, then I consulted with my partner and attorney, Hal Silent, and he just said, you know, seems like it's time to move on. So again, uh, without the continuum, a lot of owners for the league and with a lot of other, you know, it would have been good if we had franchises, which we were trying to get just uh, in December of 1973. Um, I had a meeting with the skaters, flew in to where they were skating on the road and just said, you know, this on this date, we will be shutting down. And uh, I don't think anybody expected it. And um, it, you know, really affected me for years afterwards because um, you almost feel like a parent. You feel very responsible. And uh, the funny thing is the attitude of the skaters was I'd always treated them fairly. I treated them well. Um, it was the best time of their life. They really enjoyed it. I mean, as hard as those road trips as everything else was. And, um, you know, they really regard it as a, just a very good experience. Um, a number of people and skaters tried to keep it going. And there was an operation in Northern California for the next several years. But then it kind of sputtered and died in its own way. I informed skaters at the closing date. I'd also said that I was trying to find employment for them elsewhere, and they were certainly free. Even if you know they had contracts or anything else, that they were, you know, certainly free to seek other employment. And um, uh, I remember, you know, driving west all by myself, and you know, not now I was 40, and uh, really, you know, just really being completely discouraged about the whole thing. A roller game, there was still a roller skating league. Right, and, and you know, that didn't last for very long afterwards either. I mean, it, you know, it did on a local basis, but, um, you know, it, it, it was almost as though I kind of chose to black out that time. I went into the computerized ticketing business, again with Hal Silent. Uh, we started Bass in Northern California. You know, then I went on to become executive vice president of Ticketmaster nationally. And um, I really just kind of walked away from it, you know, from um, because it, it was like the first real failure of my life. It was the fact that I couldn't keep roller derby going. And uh, yet my father understood. Uh, because, you know, 15 years before he could, had come to the same conclusion. The, the funny thing is, to this day, you know, I've heard, well, roller derby is cyclical. It comes and it goes. <clears throat> um, I think if roller derby then had had what roller jam has now, which is, you know, a very strong parent company, um, one, you know, uh, half of the ownership is of CBS Cable. They have a cable network which didn't exist in our day, putting a, the same program out every week, selling advertising, being able to, to do all these things. The, you know, the game has always had this inherent appeal. You know, the every man attraction and every woman attraction that I could be that person on the track. A lot of them don't feel that way when watching somebody like Michael Jordan because they just say, well, you know, that's a, that's a special game. 
or they can't be a crushing lineman or fullback. But oh, we ha we have always had people who said, I want to join roller derby, and they did. And they weren't necessarily skaters. And I think that was the prime appeal for the fans. You know, So that never went away. And it's funny because the question I most often ask is, well, why this time for roller derby? I said, because somebody who had um, the money, had the ability, um, had the personnel and the company that's willing to do it. Um, and that's the reason why. It, you know, it wasn't like we're reviving the hula hoop or we're bringing back, um, you know, some squeezing uh, kids in a, how many can you put in a phone booth? You know, it's not that kind of thing. Uh, the game has always had this inherent appeal and it, it's there. Uh, and that's why I think Roller Jam will s thrive for many years. And the funny thing is that Roller Jam, which is the descendant of Roller Derby, just put uh, their games on for international sales and they have sold to China, to Great Britain, to countries all over the world. It was one of the, lead the hottest sh shows that, that's out in syndication. And the interesting thing is many... Excuse me. Oh, oh. Um, maybe take it it, he'll be all right. Be okay. Yeah, just just leave him alone. He's got he had something in his mouth. He He's okay. No. Sorry. Let it happen again. I won't. Um, but, but many of these areas, the international areas, have already applied for teams. But they want teams to compete internationally because you know, it's, uh, the game is easy to follow and understand. And uh, I think that's going to be something for people to see in years ahead, you know, that, that, that you know, China or Korea will come up with their own version of an Ann Calvello. Uh, and it will happen. You know, it won't be Ann. Nothing will, you know, nothing will ever be Ann. But it's just, you know, funny when you think of, of the people who skated in Ann's era and who were really the pioneers at, at this and, you know, Ann being her unique kind of self. But that's what lies ahead. <laughs> around to Anne and the right. we have. Um, Anne was someone who at 18 was picked up by the roller derby. She basically grew up in the roller derby. Can you talk some about what part of Anne is roller derby and what part is, is Anne bringing something to roller derby? Keep in mind that. Right from the first time I got into roller derby, and I think when I was first introduced to Anne, and she started picking out nicknames for me, and you know that's. Um, she has always had this very special character and this individuality that uh, has, you know, made her almost uh, synonymous with roller derby in a lot of people's eyes. Uh, in all the interviews that I've done recently um, for Roller Jam, and there've you know literally been <laughs> dozens. Uh, they ask, well, what about the girl with the pink hair or the green hair or what Ann Calvello? Because just the persona she created, or maybe she was that persona, I was never quite sure, um, has really uh, is really something that that you know struck people, and you know they'll talk about Joan Weston, um, the Golden Girl. Ann Calvello, you know, Charlie O'Connell, and these are the names that, you know, people who suddenly, because as much as the skaters hated having their game taken away from them, the viewers suddenly were watching, and two weeks later, there was no more roller derby on television. So it, it, I am just, you know, I won't call it a nostalgia, but it's just like people wanted to know what happened to this, and, and Ann is probably the name that comes up the most. Um, how you, so, so are you saying that roller derby in general was not profitable to 
No, in the end, it wasn't. I mean, I think we all made a good living for a number of years, but in the end, um, really had to make a decision on whether, how deeply in the hole I wanted to go. And without the prospects looking that great, uh, you know, really, really doing a balance sheet. Um, I tried desperately in the last year to get other, other areas, other individuals, Madison Square Garden, other to pick up on it, but nobody could really operate that fast. David, do you mind if we go catch up with Ross? Can you also, just if you can pull the shirt apart a little bit so it's a little bit more yellow. Look at that massive chest. It is beautiful. Is that right? <laughs> How her life has transpired post-roller derby? Well, Anne um, really lived the life that she created in, of herself. She has had some very difficult times. And, you know, her most recent illness, which um, perhaps only Anne could persevere and come out of that. Um, but the interesting thing about Anne is she doesn't take a lot of backward looks. I mean, um, she doesn't forget. Believe me, she doesn't forget. You know, uh, but Anne is um, kind of chose her own path afterwards. You know, and I know she skated for some other outfits. Um, I know she feels she wasn't either well treated or respected. But um, you know, I think she's really survived triumphantly. Do you think, like, at, in the book that I was reading, the, um, that's a pick, the book that we have here, um, it was saying that Anne was one of the top paid skaters of her time. That's right. But Can you tell me what Anne would, be, would have been making at her peak? I wish I could, but I can't, you know, I can't remember. Probably, you know, probably if it was on an annualized basis, maybe four, thirty to $40,000. She didn't skate all the time. So, you know, she was paid when she skated and then probably half paid when she didn't. Um, at that time, and we can certainly say unfairly, uh, the top men skaters got more than the top women skaters. And there were no women coaches at that time. You know, women were captains of their team. But, you know, that's certainly not unique for the 50s and 60s. Um, I'm not sure she'd be happy to know, but today's skaters starting out um, are actually being paid extremely well. And uh, again, it's you know kind of a natural descendant. Um, and you know you can talk about hockey players and baseball players who made fifteen and twenty thousand dollars a year. You know what do they think when today's players are making literally millions who probably don't have the talent? Um, you know, Anne was Anne. She skated when she did, um, and she was, you know, very, very good for the game at that time. Obviously, she'd come along at this time. You know, she could have really done much better financially. Well, Anne was uh, certainly one of the most noted. Um, you know, one time green paint was put on the track. That was really before I got into it. And with the wooden wheels, it was necessary. It wasn't really a paint, it was a slate. And you could always tell the, the audience at a roller derby on the street because they'd have green hair. So I think Anne just kind of did her hair green because of that. I'm not, you know, I'm not sure, but 
and even after we brought in the plastic wheels and the track without a paint, you know, Anne would do her hair green and pink, and and people would look for that. Uh, you know, a lot of the same. She had a lot of the same elements at a later time, obviously, that like Gorgeous George the wrestler did. You know, she created this persona, and um, she in you know she was the ultimate red shirt and people knew that and they would come out to see you know and get hit and yet in somehow in spite of all this you know she was the sneaky one and she'd get away with these things and the fans would be mad and that that seemed to make Anne the happiest you know because Anne never wanted to be a white shirt and when she was put on the home team in in uh, Ohio and uh, you know that area uh, you know, she was. She complained about that a lot. Uh, Anne would go on interviews and really did a good job. And she'd complain, and you know, she'd be very much Anne, but she'd always do it, and she'd always do a good job. Um, you know, she's the one we'd send to the Kiwanis meeting in Maui if roller derby was coming over there, and you know, to to all of these places, and uh, uh, she was terrific. They were very different, and they were really, you know, competitors in a lot of ways. Um, Jones, you know, was the golden girl, you know, the blonde Amazon. And, um, uh, you know, the two of them almost in spite of themselves became the yin and the yang of the game, you know. Uh, I'm not sure that, there, that the competition didn't overlap into their lives, but yet they both made each other better. And, you know, the minute the two of them would be on the track at one time, um, you know, there would be an excitement before anything would happen. Um, and they were skaters of equal ability, which was very important, and they were both, you know, very, very good skaters. Um, but, of course, you know, Joan generally was the white shirt, the home team skater, and was the red shirt, the visiting skater, and um, they skated different games. Were the star, the level of, of celebrity sort of, how would it compare, uh, Jones and Anne, as far as the draw that they would have? Uh, well, uh, it's interesting because uh, there was always this rule in roller derby uh, that you need good white shirts to make a good red shirt team and vice versa you need a good red shirt to make a good white shirt team and uh, Joan was a huge draw on the road and we'd almost on the road never try to have her against Anne because it was like we were kind of defeating the you know our own purpose which is putting two superstars so we'd know that if we had a team on tour and Anne was one of them. We, they could go to a different, a different tour. We'd have two units out at one time, and so they obviously they skated against each other on tour. But from a box office point of view, it would be good for us to know that if Joan was going to one town, that Anne would be in another town. So. Um, Anne was, in terms of uh, working with the other. I'm sorry, let me, it can't be back yet, why not? Maybe Okay, okay, Anne was very, very good with the women on her team, the girls, she would call them. And in terms of, um, of being a woman's captain, she might have been the best in that she worked more with her players and really had no jealousy. 
because she was secure in her own ability. Now, she wasn't all, always secure in what I thought about her or what roller derby thought about her, and that was almost a constant friction because Anne had to be reassured on a fairly consistent basis in that, and that's just Anne. But in terms of the skaters that she skated with, she gave very willingly, and she really taught them, and she, and she was very proud when her girls' team did well, you know, even when she wasn't the person getting the glory. But Joan also was very good with her girls, but not the, not the same way that Anne was. You know, Anne helped create a lot of our top women skaters who could go on to captain other teams. And uh, uh, a lot of the teams, when they got good skaters, they kind of wanted to keep them in that role. Um, and Ann was always very happy when, you know, when she skated with Lydia Clay or, or some of the other skaters who skated with her, that when they went on to become, you know, top skaters, it, it was a sense of her achievement. Uh, there, uh, I can't say that there weren't on some teams that weren't jealousy of Ann, because uh, they felt that somehow she doesn't train as hard as I do, but yet she's able to skate, and that, you know, you know, kind of Anne's persona is to come in and bitch and moan, and um, so people would think, well, you know, why does Anne get away with this? And she wasn't really getting away with it, you know, or anything. It was, but uh, on the whole, she was really respected by the other women in the game. I mean, almost beyond belief. Um, at, at, you know, I tried to keep my hands off the games as much as possible. And I always felt that my strongest attribute was as the promoter, was as the business person, etc. cetera. And um, I think it surprises people perhaps to the fact that I really wasn't that close to the skaters and a lot of times as I've heard in later years, really didn't acknowledge them. You know, it was almost like it was a business and that part was the skating and that really wasn't my area. And I think Anne probably would have been happier if, you know, I had talked to her more, if I had acknowledged her more. Uh, should I say that again? I think Anne would have been happier if I talked to her more, acknowledged her more, but that just wasn't my way. You know, I was not, I wasn't a groupie of roller derby any more than I was a groupie of anything else. And I think a lot of, a lot of the skaters did not understand that. Um, what, what are your feelings, personal, personal liberty? Well, it certainly gave me, a, you know, an important part of my life. Uh, I look back on the, those 15 years as, you know, some of the best, some of the hardest. I mean, believe me, but I, I really had to learn business. And it, that was my college, the same as it was, in one sense, it was Anne's college about life. And, you know, she came out as this wonderful speaker and this wonderful personality. Um, uh, uh, it was very ironic because when roller derby shut down, and again, I'm, you know, 40, 41 years of age, and I'm thinking, what am I going to do? You know, the only thing I know how to do is promote roller derby. Well, I ended up taking what I've been doing in roller derby and applying it to the ticket business, uh, to both Bass and then Ticketmaster and creating so much of the marketing and promotion was based on what I knew. That, uh, you know, I was considered a marketing guru and these were things that I had done in roller derby. So it really, it gave me the next step in life. Then I learned a lot more in the ticket business uh, and the entertainment business. So now when I'm back working on Roller Jam, I'm, I'm not just the roller derby promoter I was 25 years ago. You know, I have this kind of additional expertise. So the, the lesson here, if anything, is that, you know, no matter what we do, we, we learn from it. It really adds to our life.
why do you think it was difficult for the theater to move on? Do well, I don't want to. I don't want to talk about you know particularly Andy Warhol's Fifteen Minutes of Fame, but many people who were stars in roller derby, same as if they were stars in baseball or anything else, that was their really moment of celebrity. And they want to keep it, and they want to capture it. Um, a lot of the skaters have gone into very successful careers in, in other areas. Nick Scopus, um, you know, Buddy Atkinson, um, just a, a number who still have this huge love for the game. I mean, you know, I, it's like if I stood up there and whistled and said, we're ready to go again, I think, you know, everybody would come and show up. But uh, Joan Weston, as, as successful as she was as a skater, you know, she really spent the last 20 years of her life trying to reestablish a training school, getting this thing going again, because roller derby was really her life. And you know, it, it's been said before, and I, I don't want to be redundant, but the ultimate irony is that her death triggered all these newspaper stories, which kind of reminded people of roller derby and, and got the interest, you know, started again so uh, that Roller Jam could come on. And, um, you know, that's a tribute, but it's also very sad. I, I don't think it's unique to roller derby. I think a lot of us in life have some places we are, some places we want to be, and when we're forced to move on, um, you know, we want to go back to what's secure. Um, I think there's a, you know, not in roller derby, but in other kinds of issues, there's women's issues of women who get divorced and yet can't go on with their lives. And I, I, in many respects, that's not this, that <laughs> dissimilar. Uh, I didn't see him, Doug, but now I can hear it. <laughs> How did you get through there? We screened you off.